Welcome to a new episode of Books and Beyond from the Winter Park Library, recorded live in the recording studio at the library in beautiful Winter Park, Florida. In Books and Beyond, we have conversations with writers, musicians, artists, presenters, and other contributors. Most of our guests have appeared live at the Winter Park Library or will be presenting soon. We hope you'll subscribe to the Books and Beyond podcast and that you'll stay up to date with library goings-on at winterparklibrary.org slash events. That's winterparklibrary.org slash events. I'm Michael Werner, and I'll be your host for our interviews. Enjoy the show. Hello out there, library patrons, readers, and smart people everywhere. Michael Werner here from the podcast at the Winter Park Library Books and Beyond. Today we have a special episode. This is a recording of a presentation that Diana did, Diana Nyad did, here in the library. Um, she's well known to most people. From her maverick open water performances in the 1970s, Diana was known as the world's greatest long distance swimmer. For the next 30 years, Nyad was a prominent sports broadcaster and journalist, filing compelling stories with National Public Radio, ABC's Wild World of Sports, and many, many others. She's a national fit- fitness icon. She's written a lot of books. She's a talent, talented linguist and is one of today's most powerful and engaging public speakers. One of her most famous accomplishments, of which she bases her book around, Find a Way, occurred in 2013 when she swam 111 miles without a shark cage from Cuba to Florida, becoming the first and only person, I think, to ever have accomplished this feat. She tells the story, this passionate story, about this heroic venture and the extraordinary life experiences that have shaped her unwavering spirit. So, over to Diana Nyad. Enjoy the, enjoy the episode. Hey, everybody. I'm Michael Werner. Uh, you may recognize my voice if any of you listen to the uh, Winter Park Library's podcast. I'm the host of the podcast. If you don't know the podcast... Go find the podcast. It's on Spotify and uh, Apple Podcasts and any other podcast platforms. It's called uh, Books and Beyond, where we interview authors and uh, other speakers that come through or near the library. Uh, so this this re- this is being recorded now. This will be an episode on the podcast in the next uh, f- in the next few days. It's called Books and Beyond. Uh, okay, you all know why you're here. You're here to see Diana and I at it. She doesn't need a whole lot of introduction. I think most of you know who she is. Uh, know some part of her story. She's uh, been in the public eye for, oh my goodness, 50 years. I mean, I've known about her my whole life, basically. And um, uh, she's, a, she's a writer, she's a speaker, she's a, obviously a marathon swimmer. Uh, maybe some of you know about her quest of, of swimming from Cuba to uh, the United States when she was 63 years old, uh, about 10, 12 years ago. Uh, so, in, as a matter of fact, today, in getting ready for this, I, I swam a half a mile, Diana, over at my... <laughs> I swam a half a mile. Yeah, Michael. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I swam a half a mile in, in, in 82 degree temperature at my, at my local gym. And uh, I figured if I could just do another 110 miles, 110 and a half miles, <laughs> and throw in some sharks and a bunch of jellyfish, I, I could sort of mimic her, her crossing from, from Cuba to the United States. Uh, before I turn it over to her, I over to Diana, I just wanted to mention one other thing. Another incredible woman had, had a saying or a quote uh, from 100 or so years ago, and it kind of made me think of Diana when I, when I heard this. Uh, it was from Helen Keller, and she said that uh, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. And I think that exemplifies uh, Diana's life and her quest. She's also here with her, uh, uh, her coach and her great friend, uh, Bonnie Stoll, uh, there, Hi. there she is. Hey, hey, Bonnie. Hey, Bonnie. You guys look like the actors. You do. You, you look somewhat like the actors. Or they look like you. I don't know which. Okay, so I'm going to turn this over to, 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 uh, to these ladies. And if you have any questions, write them on the cards. If you don't have a card, hold your hand up and Mallory will get a card for you. And I'll read the questions at the end. We thought, thought that would be a little easier. That young lady right there needs a card. You've got some young people here, too. Diana, like you said, we've got young people here. They want to talk to you. Okay, can so I see I'm, Michael? Michael, can I can I see the camera? Can I see the audience? Do you have a camera that focuses on them? Uh, we do. Let's see if we can do that. How do we do that? I want to see some of those faces if yeah, we can. Yeah, sure, we can. We're getting the technical person that can turn us around. We have to we have to move eighty people and make them turn around. No, just kidding. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. no, we don't. We'll, we'll, we will do that. We'll do that. Oh, uh, there, I can see. I can see. Okay. 
Oh, yeah, that's great. Hi, everybody. How's it going? <laughs> Good to see you. There we go. There we go. Nice. Okay. Diana, over to you. Well, Michael, you know, uh, some of what you said with your swim this morning is that often when people introduce me, they say, you know, that swim took 52 hours, 54 minutes, and 18 seconds. And uh, my joke about that is that anybody can swim 52 hours, 54 minutes. It's that last 18 seconds. <laughs> and, uh, and it was. It was a slow last 18 seconds I, getting into that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so one thing I want to tell you right off, everybody, is that I honestly haven't researched this fact, um, you know, uh, in you know journalistically, but I do believe that Bonnie and I are the only case in the annals of sports, at least at a world class, national caliber level too, where one younger is the athlete and the other is the trainer coach. So that was my case, younger. I had retired from marathon swimming. I met Bonnie at that time. She had worked her way up to becoming number three in the world on the professional racquetball circuit. And uh, if you guys remember, if you played racquetball back in the 80s, it was a big deal. It's sort of like pickleball is big now. Racquetball was big then. Everybody played racquetball. Um, there were professional tournaments on these big, you know, glass courts, and they did, they drew big crowds. Um, they all had, uh, you know, uh, deals with sneaker and racket companies. So I was Bonnie's fitness coach back then. Uh, we were young. I was 30. She was in her 20s. And now 30 and 35 years went by. I came out of retirement. And now we switched roles. And I became the athlete. And B Bonnie became my coach. And of all the people, for the 10 years when I was a marathon swimmer, back in my 20s, which was the 1970s, I had a number of different coaches. Uh, they were terrific. But nobody, even though Bonnie didn't come from the world of swimming, nobody understood like she did, what the athlete's heart and spirit were. And when I needed to, you know, some, some couple of words to get, dig down and find my true grit, when I needed to be held back and my shoulder was bothering me and I was supposed to do a 12-hour swim, and Bonnie would say, you know what, I don't like it. Today we're doing a short one. We're going out for a four-hour swim, and we're going to rest that shoulder. So, Bonnie, do you want to say anything? I want to say hi, and I'm just going to listen to you speak. <laughs> <Don't tell me. laughs> way, way to go, Bonnie. <laughs> oh, well, I, I didn't first, I first met Diana, met her in person when I was at a racquetball tournament in Poughkeepsie, New York. But before that, I had seen her on the Johnny Carson show, and I said, okay, I could kind of hang with her. I think she's pretty cool. It was really a really good, if, if you've seen the movie, you saw the scene where, when, well, you know, I was glad to see you that, that I have you this time, that kind of thing. But yeah, we were like two little golden retrievers just moving our way around, working out at that point. I feel we're still doing it, actually. <laughs> yeah, we're exactly the same. We, we met 44 years ago, and we are like two golden retrievers. We just pal around all day, and we're <laughs> like two golden retrievers. We're loyal. We're, we, we, we're with each other all the way. You know, I wanted to tell you guys, um, how, how many, uh, I can't see the audience again, but um, how many have seen the movie, the Annette Benning Jodie Foster movie? It's a, uh, about uh, two-thirds uh, of this, about well, more okay, half. So, yeah. so, okay, so let's just say, um, just as a couple of fun little um, insider stories about the movie, way before there was Netflix or there were the actors, you know, it hadn't been cast yet, um, the executive producer is a guy named Andrew Lazar, great guy, so Coke so committed to this story and getting it right and um, the love of the ocean because he's a big surfer. Um, I, I, uh, I, I went to a friend of mine. I said to Andrew, I'm going to ask a friend of mine about the casting. And I went to a friend. She's a good buddy of Bonnie and mine in, in the movie business. And I said, Gail, you know, you wouldn't call me an actor per se. I don't make my living as an actor, but I do stand on stage. I go all around the world telling stories, doing TED Talks and using my parents' foreign accents and all that. I said to her, should I screen test to play myself in the movie? And, yeah, you can laugh because she laughed and she took, she didn't take but one beat. She said, well, you only have to ask yourself one question. Do you want anyone to see the movie? 
<laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you know, you don't have to hit me over the head with a hammer. I get it. She said, listen, you can speak all over the place. You can do an off-Broadway show, which Bonnie and I did. Um, you know, you, you, you can write books, whatever, but people go to the movies to see movie stars. And did we get to? Annette Benning played me. I just, I just, I, I can still barely believe it. I pinched myself to think that an actress of this caliber played me, got into my story. And Jodie Foster, it doesn't get any bigger or better than that, played Bonnie. So we hung out with them um, quite a bit over many months before shooting started. Um, Bonnie, tell them about the necklace story. When we, we went to the Dominican Republic, and uh, as I said, we knew them both very well, and this is what happened. Well, Jody was walking back to her, what are those called? T uh, trailer. Yeah, trailer. And um, we're walking, and she's fits in, fits in a necklace. I said, that is so funny. I have something that looks so similar to that. She goes, no kidding, Bonnie. How about this and this and this? You know, everything. She just got it. She just got it. She's a fabulous human being, and we had a ball. We had a ball, and we're still hanging out with them a little bit, which is great. Yeah, yeah. They'll be friends for life. Yeah. But the funny thing about the necklaces, like like Jody's real statement with Bonnie was, these, these are replicas of your necklaces. Don't you get it? That's what we're doing here. We are you. <laughs> and she pointed he pointed to Annette Benning, who was getting oh, getting yeah. interviewed about 40 yards away. And she was sitting in the white Cuba T-shirt I always wore. And um, Jody pointed to her and said, now, do you see, do you think Annette really wants to wear her hair that way? No, <laughs> she's trying to be you. So, uh, so uh, anyway, we got these two world-class actresses to be us. You know, but I wanted to say something rather, you know, on a more philosophical level about um, my story, our story, and that is that clearly, you know, at, at, on the very, very basis of it, isn't it? It's a story about an extreme endurance athlete doing an extreme endurance endeavor. And it, 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 of course it is that, and a lot of the vocabulary of the story has to do with that, whether it's what, you know, the currents and the sharks and the jellyfish and the training and, and how you get through the sensory deprivation of not having any visual, very little visual or audio input. So you are just into the interior of your mind while you're out there. So there are all those eccentric details about this eccentric sport. And but this eccentric person doing it. Yes, not to mention. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, but, but really... Above that, you know, in a macro level above that, we hear from people from all over the world, from Winter Park to Beijing to Chile. We hear from people who can relate to this story, who have nothing to do with swimming, and they have nothing to do with sports. What they are seeing is an unapologetic will to, to stay with something, to not quit no matter no matter what goes wrong no matter even if you come near death which is no hyperbole i should have could have died the night being stung by those box jellyfish but there was something about my spirit our whole team spirit that said we can do this we keep getting beat by mother nature and mother nature on steroids out there it was now has been called the mount everest of the earth swims it's a blue planet and uh, people, brave, good swimmers, are swimming all over the world, all the time. But this swim has been considered the, the, the top, the, 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 the peak, because of all the you know, difficult obstacles to overcome. So since 1950, men, women, strong, young, fast, have been trying this crossing. And I'm the first one who did it without a shark cage. That's a whole other kind of get into the weeds of the sport, the shark cage. But the real point is that it's not about swimming. It's about true grit. It's about not going to the end of your life with regrets. I got a chance to uh, meet, uh, we can't say we can't, became close, fast friends, but we became friends, Christopher Reeve, and he had already had his accident. So here he was, one of the, our most handsome, charismatic actors. He played Superman on the big silver screen, handsome as heck. When I met him, he had had his accident falling off his horse, and now he was a quadriplegic. He couldn't move anything but his facial muscles. And still handsome as heck, 
and still Superman to me. But Chris was very big on regrets. I don't know if any of you there ever got a chance to meet him, but had you met him today, if he had been in that, in that library with you today, he would have gone around to every one of you and asked what your dreams are. What have you left behind? What is still out in front of you, whether you're young, middle-aged, or old? Because he would say to you, you have no idea what banana peel you might strangely slip on tonight and become a quadriplegic like me and not be able to chase those dreams anymore. So he was very big on dream, chasing dreams. And when I was turning 60, I had been out of the sport for 30 years. I already tried Cuba when I was young in my 20s, 42 hours, huge roiling seas that wouldn't allow us, Mother Nature on steroids, to get to the other side. Um, and I hated to leave that dream behind. I really did. It, it gnawed at me. But you know, you have to live your life also. I needed to start making a living. I was getting offers from the wide world of sports and, you know, um, national public radio, Fox Sports. And I started for those 30 years from 30 when I retired from swimming the first time uh, up to 60. Those 30 years, you're not going to find me complaining about those 30 years. I was traveling the world, following the best in the world, pursue their excellence from the Olympic Games to the Tour de France to the U.S. Tennis Open Tennis Championships to the New York City Marathon, all of these people, you know, outrageously motivating and um, and and superbly talented at what they do, and 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 I was inspired. But meeting Christopher Reeve right at that time, around age sixty, and and his expressing, "Don't don't do it. Don't leave anything on the table." You might not succeed. That doesn't matter. Just don't sit around not chasing your dreams. And that got me itching a little bit. And now to get into a literary moment, because, you know, we're all readers here. And um, I had not been big on poetry in my life. I just, uh, it's, it's my weakness. I don't understand poetry in general. Every poem I read, when I get to the end of it, I, I, I think, Why? You know, if they would just use two or three more verbs, you know, I would understand what, what they're trying to say. But I'm often left out of poetry. It's too too esoteric for me. But I had read, and I bet you everybody at your library today, starting with you, Michael, have read Mary Oliver. And I bet you've read Mary Oliver, The Summer Day. So just as I met Christopher Reeve, just as also my mom had just died, just as... I was, you know, beginning to feel like a spectator a a as this journalist. I was following around these people chasing their dreams. I wasn't chasing my own anymore. I wasn't a doer. So all those things happened right as I was turning 60, and I dug up that Mary Oliver poem. And that, that, that last line of hers, a couple of lines actually, you know, have been used, you know, now just, you know, all over the place. Uh, because they express so much of what I'm trying to say here. No, no regrets behind. And I must have read those last two lines of that poem of hers, The Summer Day, a thousand times, recited them a thousand times that month, August 2009, when I was turning 60. And they go like this. I'm sure you guys will recognize them. Tell me, what is it you plan to do with this one wild and precious life of yours. Well, I, 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 you could have blown me over like a feather. It was the thousandth time more or less. I was in my car. I screeched over the side of the road and I thought, will the shoulders come back? I stayed in good shape during those 30 years, but not a swimmer anymore. I said, will, will the shoulders become swimmer's shoulders again? Will the, will the will that I had like steel, will it fire up again? Because, you know, you don't know if it's there. You've got to test it and see if you've got it. But that's the day. Turning 60, I thought, that's what I'm doing with this one wild and precious life. And to hopefully not be too redundant. But for me, it barely had to do with swimming, even though it was all about swimming. It was about chasing the biggest dream I had ever had. So, you know, that that's sort of the if I could lay the, the, the groundwork as we, you know, before we get into questions or really start talking about everything. So I, I, uh, I value so many other 
parts of myself and 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 things I want to do with my life. I'll be 75 in a couple of months. And, um, you know, I'm not, you know, in any sort of, uh, you know, freak out way, worried about being 75. All I know is I'm a lot closer to the end of my life than I am the beginning. I still have big dreams. Um, and it, it, although it's difficult, you know, it, it is. When, when you played a sport, sports are so high octane. Sports are so dramatic. They have a black and white. You're either going to win or you're not going to win, um, even though the journey is something, you know, to, to be valued as you go along. But, but it's difficult. Like, I wonder how Serena Williams feels. And Bonnie's a huge tennis fan. You might weigh in on this. So Serena, as far as we know, there's no judgment, has a great life. She's uh, into her family in a big, big way. She's a very successful businesswoman. But I would guess that she won't feel that octane that she felt when she was number one in the world on a night match, in a night match at the U.S. Open with thousands of people in awe of her and rooting for her and millions of more around the world watching in awe of her and rooting for her. I'm not sure that she she would ever be able to top that again. What do you think, Bonnie? Well, I think it's just a different feeling. I think it's a different feeling. She's a mom now. She has the most intimate feelings in the world for, for her kid. So it's just a different feeling. No, I don't think she's ever going to feel that high, but she will feel that great in a different way. Okay. Well, that's a bit of wisdom, and I like to think of it that way because me, um, I do live the biggest life I can. I kind of try to go to bed every night just exhausted and just hit the pillow saying, wow, I just, I couldn't have done anything more with that day of the things I value, which has to do not always with just chasing your own success, but it has to do with friendship. It has to do with the dogs in your life. It has to do with looking up at the sky. Bonnie and I run a, a walking initiative called Everwalk. Check it out. Come walk with us. We're doing a big summer challenge right now, virtual online. So it's at everwalk.com. And when I walk, I look up at the blue sky, just like when I was out swimming, to look up at the two billion stars you can see on a clear night in the Gulf Stream in summer. And I take in this, this magnificent blue rock that we live on, that we're so lucky to call our home, and try to do my little bit about not using single-use plastic bottles, you know, that are, that are, you know, ruining our oceans, et cetera. But... I guess I'm I'm really getting around to the point that I'm not sure I'll ever feel anything that big, that dramatic as coming out finally after chasing that dream for 35 years, trying it five times. I'm not sure I will ever feel that high, you know, that drama that I felt on that beach that day or swimming, you know, those last few hours toward that that final triumph. But that doesn't mean that I don't pluck from that endeavor. Um, all those years of focusing on it, the things that I value, dreaming big, for instance, I, it takes courage to fail. I would rather fail and chase something big where I have to be, I have to touch down to every fiber of my potential, emotionally, physically, psychologically, than set a low bar and achieve things that are very easy all the time. No judgment by me about anybody else's life. But for my life, I'd rather set big goals and fail over and over again, you know, rather than set, set that mediocre bar. Um, when, when I didn't make it, and I should say when we didn't make it, because it, it, to talk about that in a minute, it, this is truly, it looks like the most solitary thing you could ever do. And on the truth of it, I'm the only one whose arms are coming up left after right, but right over there, right over there, 17 feet to my left on that boat Voyager is Bonnie. I, every training swim, 10 hours this day, 12 hours this day, 14 hours this day, on every breath, 53 times a minute looking to my left, there's Bonnie. She pees right over the side of the boat. She, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> He never, ever would leave my side for all those hundreds of hours of training and the four attempts that we did. So that's the beginning of the team. That's the head of the team. And then you've got 
the expert shark divers of the tropics. You've got the number one jellyfish, box jellyfish expert in the world, Dr. Angel Yanigihara. Um, you've got um, uh, you know, a, a team of 40 people, medical doctors, the navigator, a mathematical genius. Um, you've, you've got all these people. And so I'm the only one. It looks like I'm the only one doing this thing. And when I get to shore, I couldn't get there without all 40 of my team. We did this. I didn't do it. And the last thing, Michael, before we get to questions, I wanted to say was when I didn't make it, so we'll call those failures, you know, I didn't get to the other side, although, you know, you all know the ancient Greeks, you know, had their philosophies of all of life is about the journey, not necessarily the destination. You may not get to where you thought you were getting to, but what have you learned? What have you discovered about yourself, about the world at large? on your way and all of those failures if you want to call them that the four 1978 then coming up to 2010 2011 2012 um our team yes we were crushed we worked hard we put everything into it we trained hard and when we didn't make it to key west it was, there was disappointment there's no getting over it but each one of those trips was a prideful journey we were in a state of discovery. And you know how many people sent me after every one of those failures? People sent me the Teddy Roosevelt uh, arena speech. So many people sent me that speech, which to paraphrase grossly, Teddy Roosevelt said, you go ahead. You sit in that comfortable armchair of yours and you be the critic. You be the observer who sits on the sidelines, who's timid, who can't get into the ring. You don't have the stuff to get into the ring. Well, Teddy Roosevelt says that guy in the ring, the guy who's getting pummeled and is bloodied and dirtied and he falls, but he gets up again and he gets pummeled and he gets bloodied and dirtied again, but he gets up again. He gets up every time, even if he's going to get smashed at, at the end and lose. Teddy Roosevelt says, I'd rather be that guy than the cold critic who sits on the sidelines. So that's how we felt. Every time we didn't make it, like every expedition on Mother Earth, whether you're snowshoeing across Antarctica or you're trying to climb Annapurna or one of the big peaks, you come home, whether you've made it or not. And you have new science, you have new intel, you have new ways even to tap down into the human spirit. And pretty soon you have a better expedition and you have a better chance going out. Everybody always asks me and asks Bonnie and asks the team, why? why? Why did you make it on that fifth time? What was different? Well, we had learned a great deal from the first and the second and the third and the fourth. And we were the only ones who ever tried it who came back to try it again. And so don't we deserve to make it? Yes, we, we, would, we refuse to give up. And that really more than anything is why we made it to the other side. I think when you read the great stories of um, Nelson Mandela uh, and you know the people who have truly, truly shown perseverance more than any quality, they in their books and in their accounts of, of who they are and what they do, they'll say, of course, it takes talent, it takes luck, it takes timing, it takes colleagues and friends, it takes all of that to be successful at anything we do, but more than anything, it takes perseverance. You know, the human condition is to suffer. You know, all of us, all of us, we don't get through life without heartache and without suffering. And those who go down because they're knocked down by whatever it is, when they get back up, that's, that's when they show their true grit and their perseverance. And that's when they have the best chance of making it to the other side. And Michael, the last thing really I want to say is that I never compare myself to people who go to war, to people who are fighting cancer, to people who are raising perhaps a disabled child in a very difficult situation. I was in a sport, and yes, it's a tough sport. It's grueling, um, although it does have some magic out in the middle of that, that big blue planet of ours. Um, but but I, re I remind myself, I chose to do this. You know, I wasn't, a grenade was not thrown at me in Iraq you know, over a field. So I'm, I'm very careful not to compare myself to people who have been true survivors of war or disease or, or tragedy. All right. I think, honestly, that's, that's kind of a, a bunch of the stuff I wanted to throw out, Michael. Okay. And now, 
you're welcome to ask any questions you've got. Yeah, sure. Uh, I've got a couple questions, and then uh, I'm going to uh, read some questions we have from, from the audience here. Uh, and uh, again, to everybody out there, if you have a, a question you'd like to put, put it on the note card and raise your hand, and Mallory will, will, will bring it down to me. Uh, okay, Diana, here's a question I have for you. Uh, obviously, the will to accomplish a dream, a goal, uh, you have that. You had that, and you still have that. Do you think that's something that's just innate, or can you, can you teach that to somebody? I mean, most of us just kind of say, nah, that's, uh, no, 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 I, I'm not going to do, you know, I, I, no, no, no. I swam a half mile today. That's, that's enough. I, <laughs> you know, I, I'm done. Okay. So can you teach that, or how, where does that come from? You know, I, I, I'm not a parent, and I'm not a sociologist, but it seems to me when I, I talk to my friends who have children, and they'll, they'll point to, you know, let's say they'll say, have you ever met my son, Bruce? He's 38 years old now, but his personality is exactly what you would have found when he was 18 months old playing around in his crib. He is just relentless. He, he wants to get somewhere. He, um, he won't take no for an answer. Oh, but maybe you've not met my other son, Doug. And um, when you, if you had met him when he was 18 years old, he was very passive. Nothing bothered him. He, he, he wasn't reaching toward anything. He was just happy as he was. So I don't have a judgment about it, Michael, but I do believe there are many people who are happy not chasing big dreams, not trying to be, you know, epic in their lives. And I actually admire that. I look to people who just are <laughs> happy. They're just, they're just happy, you know, doing what they're doing. So uh, I, I, I think, you know, everything has a little bit of nature and a little bit of nurture to it. But as but far as I know, if people don't have that kind of deep driving personality that they've, they've shown all their lives, I don't think there's any book they read or any quote they hear that makes them change entirely into that kind of person. Okay. Uh, question, uh, question for Bonnie. Uh, yes, Bonnie. Uh, and this might have been an effect. It might have been, you know, for dramatic effect in the movie itself. But in the movie, there are several scenes where you kind of get Diana to stop talking. Uh, okay. Just, oh well, in, that's in not movie. an easy. That's that's a chore in any case. <laughs> so th that wasn't. Hey, for I heard that. <laughs> that that wasn't for dramatic effect. Then that that's that's no. that, that's your life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, don't go away, Bonnie, because I got another question for you right from, 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 from the audience. Uh, okay. Uh, somebody from the audience says, why in the world did you do this? <laughs> Myself? You, you. Well, to that person, I said I did it for the tan because <laughs> I did it because I believed in my very best friend in the world and I needed to see her, uh, see how, you know, I'd never seen her really, really swim. I remember the news when uh, she swam around Manhattan Island. But I, I never had seen her and watched her stroke. And we went to Mexico for a training swim. And I have to tell you that Diana is one with the water. It was, you know, when you see anybody do what they do best, it's, it's, it's really beautiful. But when you see your very best friend do what she does best, I was in awe. And that's what got me in. Okay. Very, very nice. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Diana, we're going to let you talk again, Diana. Uh, this is this is a question for you. Uh, two of the people here in the audience, this is their question. They were in the audience on the beach in Key West on your cool. fifth swim. So, Fantastic. Yeah, hey, they're, they're raising yeah, All right. Yeah, get their names, Michael. Ask them what their names are. What are, what are your yeah. names? Pam and Carolyn. Pam and Carolyn. Hi, said, Pam. Carolyn? Yeah. Oh, that's great you were there. Thank they, you. They said that they were about 15 feet away from you as the medics swarmed around you, and they were very concerned, as I'm sure you were too, as it was Bonnie, they were very concerned for you as you looked in pretty bad shape. So the question yeah. is, have you had any long-term health effects from this adventure? No, no, you know, all, all that goes away. But I will say that we had planned, we didn't know, you know, that's, a, that's a, one of the conundrums about that swim is that you need the weather for two to three days. You can't go out with it. You know, the trade winds blow from the east. They blow 6,000 miles across the Atlantic Ocean from Africa. Matter of fact, you can stand on the docks in Havana and in Key West on certain days and put your tongue out and sense a little crunching. And you think it's the salt from the vapor, from the ocean vapor. 
It's not. Some days they call it the Sahara dust. It's actual sand particles from the Sahara Desert in Africa that have blown that more than that 6,000 miles. So um, what, what was my point? What were we going for right there? Um, Any long-term effects? Oh, long-term effects. So we didn't know when the swim was going to be. Every year we started training in September to get ready for a summer event. I want to do the swim in the summer when the water's the warmest because you think, well, you know, come on, you start out, it's 83 degrees, it's, it's the tropics, you're going to be warm, but your body is 98.6. It's just like if you take a bath. You sit in a bath, and you're, you're not stroking from Cuba to Florida, you're rested, you're going to do the crossword puzzle, you put the bath to a night like, like 101, 102 degrees, it feels lovely, and as you're sitting there, as soon as it starts cooling off, when it goes below 98.6, you reach over and you put more hot water in it. So if you're in 83 degree water, yes, it feels warm. When you're strong and you're at the beginning and you're, you're trained up, you know, it feels very warm. Bonnie had to be careful to hydrate me, you know, to a big degree, those first 12 to 20 hours. Now you're, you're in a state of hyperthermia in the beginning if you're too hot. And, and you're working hard also. Now, as it goes by and you're in there for 48 hours, 50 hours, 54 hours, now you're starting to feel chilly. Even 83 degrees can feel chilly to you. So you, you don't know when you're going to go. You, you train up. You start in September. We went down to St. Martin in the Caribbean. We also trained in Mexico. Um, then we trained in Key West. But we would, we would get, get in shape from September to May, the end of May, then move to Cuba, up, move to Key West, have the whole team sequestered in Key West. We'd go down for night, night swims. We had, John Bartlett, our genius navigator I referred to, would go out into the Gulf Stream and check the Gulf Stream current angles and you know how, how fast the stream was moving, et cetera. And now we're just waiting for weather. We're waiting for that three to four day window and we can't have the, the winds blowing as they do almost every day from the east because that wind comes bumping up against the mighty Gulf Stream water current. And the air and water current hit each other and you've got stiff peaks out there. So you've got to wait until that easterly wind dies a bit or even clocks around to a different direction, hopefully south behind you, but then the weather rarely holds. You know, you've got a good forecast. We're all excited. We go on what we call amber alert, means maybe. Maybe we're leaving in a couple of days, and then the winds change, the weather changes, and it's no good anymore. So it's just, and you know, everybody, the big climbers, Everest, et cetera, they have these weather stories too. Somebody can go to Everest for 10 years in a row and never get a chance to go up to the summit because the big winds come in. Right. And it's never mind over matter. You know, in the four times that we didn't make this swim, there was never a when I put my hand up and I said, I just, I can't do it. You know, it's just, it's, I, I bit off more than I could chew. I should have trained more. It was never like that. We were 100% mentally and physically, and Mother Nature, you know, came in with either storms or jellyfish or, you know, uh, something that, that kept us from being able to make land. But we waited and waited that last year, 2013, we were in Key West, early June, ready and we just can't get it. We get a one day window, not a two to three to four day window. We can't do it. And finally it gets to be Labor Day weekend. But unbeknownst to us as to when we were gonna do it, we had planned to do a Hurricane Sandy. Hurricane Sandy had hit New York City mm -hmm. and the East Coast in a huge way just the month, the year before, um, still many neighborhoods suffering from the results, Hurricane Sandy. So we planned, and it was a big engineering you know, operation. We had a pool built in Italy, had it installed in New York City in front of Macy's at Herald Square. And the plan was for me to swim, it was a 40 meter pool, for me to swim for 48 hours in one lane, just nonstop, wow. 48 hours, not fast, just keep going. Yeah. And in the lane next to me, there were only two lanes. It was a narrow pool. There were people 15 minutes at a time, and they came to support and raise money for Hurricane Sandy. Like, how, Bonnie, give them people an idea of what kinds of people swam next to me in that swim. All different 
shapes and sizes of human beings. And there was a dog that went through Hurricane Sandy <laughs> that was next lane also. It was really cool. There were there were people in the movies. There were people, there were a couple of Down syndrome kids that were fantastic. It was it was it was really a great experience for sure. What, but what? we never should have done that long a swim five weeks after the main swim. It was a little long. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was the point is clearly it was a pool, not the ocean. There yeah. were no jellyfish, but there were no sharks. But um, I suffered during that 48-hour swim uh, to, to the point of how, how long does it take you to heal up after swimming the 54-hour swim. Um, I'd, say, I'd say it was probably six months till I really gained all the weight back and felt, felt myself again. Um, but that swim, that swim in, for Herald Square for Hurricane yeah. Sandy, because it was so close just a few weeks after the Cuba swim, I, I suffered through that, I'll tell you. So what was the, and this is related to a question we had from the audience, what was the recovery, the immediate recovery like after you got to Key West? I mean, did you just collapse for five days or what What, what was that like? No, I'll answer that. Okay. Um, many interviews for Diana and then that night she got up to use the restroom in the middle of the night and she slammed straight into the door right down the middle of her face. There was a big brown mark. And then two hours later, it was morning. And it was the very first morning in five years, we weren't watching the Weather Channel. So that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, what's That's, your... And you know, sorry, people, um, Michael, I was just going to add on to that to say that Everybody thinks, you know, people who aren't in this sport or in, you know, extreme endurance events says, oh, after all that, you must have sat down that night and eaten, eaten a huge bowl of spaghetti or steak. I had such deep, Six two meats. things. I had deep, deep cuts and, um, and uh, you know, uh, uh, friction, friction stuff in the inside of my mouth. Um, it, you know, the salt water swells everything up and you're, now your teeth are cutting the sides of your face. So it's, it was very uncomfortable. And I used a straw to just drink protein shakes and lemonades and milkshakes and stuff like that for several days. And you've been working hard. Like Bonnie will tell you in the last, I don't know, 10 to 12 hours of that swim, I didn't want to take down any food. My system was was in a state of duress from from working hard. You're trying to go across this current. Like if you guys are facing the map here, Key West is down south. Uh, Havana's down south, and straight north up here is Key West. These two points. Well, the Gulf Stream. You know, you're trying to swim north, 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 and the Gulf Stream has come squeezing over here through the Yucatan Channel, the most powerful current in all the Earth's oceans. And right here between Cuba and Florida, that Gulf Stream is flowing due east. I'm averaging around 2.2 miles an hour, if I'm lucky. That stream is going at 6.6 .6 miles an hour. So I keep bringing up the genius, John Bartlett. His job is to have this little vessel, me, crossing this current. And the current's 85 miles wide. So of the 100 miles that you're trying to swim, 110 yeah. was mine, you're, you're in it. You're in it from the time you leave Cuba to the time you get out of it and try to make Florida. And you're having that navigator is having to tack you, you know, a little bit this way, a little bit this way and trying to get you from from getting, you know, pulled east, due east the whole time. So, you know, you're you're kind of in that state of um, of of precarious. If, if you have to take you can never get out on the boat. You can't touch the boat. But if there's a shark sighting and I need to be over close to the boat, real quiet, not making any splashing. And let's say it takes them 15 minutes to solve that shark problem. And they're, they're diving underneath and now they can become sure that that particular animal is not around anymore. Well, for that 15 minutes while I'm treading water, I have been dragging east, east, east. Now the navigator, once I start swimming again, has got to make up for that and have me go against that current somehow, you know, to get heading toward Key West again. So it's a, it's a really tricky navigational swim. If you could just get in with no current at all, it's a, it's a long way. Let's, let's not pretend. My swim is 110.86 miles, point to point. That's how they measure it. They don't measure how many miles you swam going over this way or that way. The, you, you measure from the point you left to the point you arrived, and, you know, for, for all, all that, you know, trek, trek across there, you are, as I say, you're putting out and you can't possibly take in the food and fuel you take, can't make up for what you're spending as you go across. But that swim would be 
Not easy, but it would be much, much, far, far easier if you didn't have that current, that easterly current that you're fighting. Occasionally, you could lie back and look up at the stars in the Gulf Stream, or you could, you could, you know, tread water and get a little bit of rest for your shoulders, but not on this swim. You take that quick feeding, and you're on your way again. Wow, amazing. Diana, I think you're going to mm -hmm. like this one. And for those of you that maybe came in later, uh, Diana and I were talking at the beginning here before the, the, the presentation actually started. Uh, she said her next project is she's working on a children's book, a chapter book. And uh, I think this next question comes from one of the younger people here in the audience, if, if I, oh, good. If I oh, saw good. who handed it in. So I think you might like it. She said, my friend feels a great urge to do something with her wild and precious life, but she feels lost as to what exactly that is. Any words of advice on how to find her Mount Everest? You know, that's such a great question because we all assume that everybody has some big dream, you know, and it's just not true. It's, it's just not, not the way of life. And that doesn't mean people can't live a big life and big, live their best life, even if they're not chasing a big dream. But there is a there there's a you know a, a great German philosopher and writer Goethe and I used to keep this quote on my desk for a long time so I don't have it in front of me and again like with the Teddy Roosevelt thing I'll paraphrase it but young people ask me that question all the time young people in their early twenties for instance come up to me and said I, I, I you know I'm, I finished college and now. I've got passion, I've got discipline, but I, I don't know what I want to pursue. Nothing's exciting me. Well, Goethe said, there's magic in beginning things. So instead of sitting around hoping that this vision is going to come to you of what you want to do, what you want to be, you go out in any direction. You know, let's say for this summer, let's just make it up. Let's say for this summer, you decide to take a, a carpentry course and uh, because you have some interest in carpentry. I know I do. Um, so, you, you know, you go out and you think, you know, maybe that's what I'll do. I'll become a, a master carpenter. I'll make beautiful tables and chairs and I'll work with a with a big design company. And as you start in, you're in there a couple of months and you're learning, you decide that that's not really it. But you met this guy or you met this woman doing the the carpentry course who's into a completely different thing and you start talking you guys start going out to coffees and you start really getting excited about that thing so the point is there's magic in beginning and it, you know nothing nothing comes to us sitting around hoping we're going to get an inspiration hoping a, a knight is going to ride on a horse through our living room and tell us what to do. You just go out and there's no shame in not finishing what you go out to do because that step you take, that action you take is going to lead you to the next thing or the next thing. And pretty soon you take enough action steps, you're gonna be finding your real dreams. Okay, good, great. Uh, what is your current workout? That's another question. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I like to think that I stay in pretty top fitness shape. Um, I do swim some, you know, you, it's so, so ridiculous to compare if you've been doing that kind of uh, intense swimming. But I always try to keep my stroke together and keep the appreciation of meditating, you know, as you glide along the ocean. The, um, the, only, the only negative for me living out here in Los Angeles now is that this Pacific right here is pretty darn chilly. So every time I get a trip, and lately I've been lucky, I was in Barcelona, swam in the Mediterranean one day, um, I've been in Miami recently and that, that beautiful warm water. I'm going to Key West again soon. So when I get near a warm ocean, I try to get in a swim. I become fanatical about tennis. I fell in love in ten with tennis as a child in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Chris Everett was there. She's five years younger than me, but we've been friends all this time. And, you know, what a, what a, um, you know, great champion, but along with that, what a modest human being. I would see her like at the drugstore, you know, when, <laughs> when when I was like 15 and my picture had been in the local paper for some swim meet and she had just won Wimbledon. So, you know, <laughs> she was... She would say to me, oh, Diana, my mom showed me your, your story in the paper. I, I said, well, let's not talk about that. Congratulations on Wimbledon. And she'd want to bring it right back to me. You know, so she was that person. So she was the first one I admired. But um, I have been following tennis my whole life. I'm an, an admirer of all racket sports, which brings us back to yeah. this one over here. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, yeah. I'm doing a puzzle. Yeah, you want to you want to know what kind of ADD Bonnie has? Look, she's doing a jigsaw puzzle. That's great. While she couldn't possibly just sit here, you know, during this interview. But Bonnie is um, I I, I couldn't overstate it. She is very talented with any racket she picks up. So during COVID, I took up tennis and. Poor Bonnie, they say that, you know, if you can play with someone better, you're going to get better. And unfortunately, Bonnie was playing with me, so she got worse by the day. <laughs> I was playing with her, so I was getting better by the day. So uh, I'll never be as good as she is, but we play. And, um, you know, I, I, if I have the time, I'll play for hours a day. And I do a, I do a pretty, what I'd call a pretty kick-ass gym workout, yeah. you know, with a lot of jumping jacks, burpees, um, long series of planks. Um, I've got a, uh, I could take my computer in and show you, but um, I've, I've got a, a pull down machine that's quite like a swimming machine. You know, you pull it down this way, you can work it one arm or, but I'll do that for 90 minutes. Um, so oh. I, I like to think I keep in, you know, I'm not sure I could keep in any better shape than I do. You right have now. a gym there at home? I yeah. do. Yeah. Sure. And I, and the best thing about it is in the corner, I have a little uh, neon light and when you turn it on, I'll go in there early, like at dawn. I turn on that neon light, and it says, persist. And like I said before, when we talked about perseverance, persevere, persist, more than anything, to me, that's what's going to get me everywhere I want to go. If I just stick with it, no matter how disappointed I get, no matter what little failures come my way, I persist and persist, and I'm going to get there one day. Uh, another question, uh, ladies. Uh, I think this is a, another one from, a, from one of our younger members. Uh, what was the most scary thing during your, your swim to, 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 to Key West? Was it the jellyfish, the sharks, or failure? No, um, and I wouldn't even say failures because they were such learning experiences. Those were, those were not the toughest part. The toughest part for me was knowing that the shark divers were doing their job, that Diana never saw sharks, but she also didn't see the, the pods of dolphins and the turtles, so many beautiful things out there that Diana didn't see. Uh, but the scariest, no question about it, was when Diana got uh, stung by the box jellyfish because very few people live through that once, let alone twice. And we found out later, once we were in uh, cahoots with Dr. Angel Yannick O'Hara, that the worst thing, the best thing for most jellyfish is an epinephrine shot, not with the box. And Diane, and the the uh, the, e, the ER person that was with us on the swim, he was he was part of the um, the shark team also, but he was uh, um, an EMT. He because he dove in the water to help Diana. We weren't sure what it was because the box jellyfish had never been in the Gulf before, and he got stung and. We said, just get on the boat and, and save yourself. But he gave himself two epinephrine shots. His pulse went down to like four beats a minute. Wow. And all he kept his saying breath, was, his breath, his breath, I'm sorry, his, his breaths went down to four beats a minute. And then he kept saying, I mean, I've never seen anything like it. She's still swimming. I don't know how she's still swimming. So it was, it was quite an impressive uh, feat, to say the least. Uh, but the truth is, those jellyfish are quite scary. And I don't love the sharks, but Diana doesn't even think of the sharks. The whole time at night, all I see are sharks. All I see. They're, they're not really sharks, but the shark team did have to take care of a few sharks. Now, they would never, ever hurt a shark because we're, we're invading their space at this point. So they have uh, some either broomsticks or, or uh, what's the poles called? called the the, the EV, piping yeah the piping. piping with a big tennis ball at the end and they would just prod them to make them go away and if they became a little aggressive the shark divers would would go swim underneath the shark and now the shark was their prey it was it, you know i learned so much about the ocean and and who really runs it, it was great really great were, were those were those the guys in the in the kayaks the shark team? No, those are kayakers. The kayakers were there so Diana doesn't go left or right too far, but they were also there because they had the shark shields on the bottom of their kayaks. So Diana can tell you about the shark shields. Yeah, it's a, it's a, um, it's a, 
it's a you know electrical impulse so there's a there's a kayaker uh maybe 10 12 feet off to my right and on the bottom of his or her boat is a it's a shield about as big as the palm of your hand and as your boat moves forward it has a, an antenna on the back of it about four or five feet long and that antenna trails out you know like on the surface of the water there's a similar kayak with a similar shield behind me by 10, 12 feet. And those two shields speak to each other. And they create an elliptical field of electricity, which, of course, has been tested to be a particular a frequency that bothers the sensitive sonar on the shark's snout. So hopefully that electricity is enough. You know, that, that would be enough to cover you. But unfortunately, we were shown some footage of... Uh, sharks that if throw in the Bahamas, if you throw chum in, and even with the shark shield, some, mostly they went away, but if they're hungry, they're 50, 60 miles from shore, they haven't eaten in a week, and a low frequency vibration swimmer is making a, a, a sound like dying wounded fish on the surface, the shark could come in and that shark will go through that electricity if, they, if they're really that hungry. Wow. Um, the funny thing is that when we interview marine biologists about the sharks of the tropics, so these are the oceanic white tips, the tigers, the lemon sharks, they, are, they can be very dangerous. But as a general rule, all these shark experts say to you, you know, these are extremely intelligent animals, the tropic sharks. Um, they know the homo sapien is not their food. They do not want to come in and they won't come in and eat you whole. Now, if one is hungry enough and it hasn't eaten in a week or longer, they might come up and take a leg. Okay, they might. So when we hear that, we think, well, that's, that's not that heartening. We better do something even more than the shark shields. So what we had was our team of divers. And two by two, they didn't need to in the day so much because the water is so clear out there. You can see to a half mile, you know, from the top of our boat, they can see a dark, a dark body, you know, a half mile out to get in and do their thing if they need to. But at night, we don't use any lights. Lights attract jellyfish. Lights attract sharks. So at night, we go pitch black unless there's, there happens to be moonlight that night. And those divers are, are courageous. They go below me two at a time, looking for the fluorescence of the shark's eyes in case they, they come up aggressively toward us. And as a general rule, they're really just curious, those sharks. But I was going to say, as Bonnie did, there was never a moment that was life or death like being stung by those box jellyfish. Not every species of box, if Angel were here with us today, she would give you a quick education but about them. You'd have to really spend the night. Yeah, because she knows so much. There's never a quick. There's, there's never a Yanagihara quick, quick moment. But um, uh, what was I going to say about the jellyfish? Oh, there are thousands and thousands of species of jellyfish. Portuguese men of war, which is off the coast of Florida, is no picnic. If all of you guys have ever been stung by the Portuguese men of war, it's not fun. But nobody has ever died from a Portuguese man of war sting. People have often died from the box jellyfish stings, often one or two seconds after being stung. Not every box. There is different box. But the ones I ran into, um, they, 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 they emit what's called the Irukandji syndrome. So if the tentacle, you know, it's very wispy. It feels like a strand of human hair. It's very light. When it touches your, your hand or sweeps across your lips, you can barely feel it, but it has hundreds of thousands of little tiny harpoons on it. And when it whips to your skin, it is penetrating those harpoons to, to shoot that venom into your central nervous system. And it's trying to paralyze your spinal cord. So that's what I felt when I first, I was in, in a di respiratory distress from it too. And I was screaming out, Bonnie, help me, help me on a fire. And I, I, my, my spine was, was paralyzed. So I lived through that night. And as Bonnie says, our, our doctors on board, uh, one of the doctors was, was stung himself and he had trouble just recuperating back to a normal breath pattern. But um, I, I should have died. I should have died that wow. night. And yes, 
okay, I survived it. I didn't get out on the boat. I kept swimming, but now I was weakened. So I wasn't swimming hard to the north that we needed to. The next day at dusk, bam, I was stung again. And this time, and they would have to call it a staged swim where you get out, you, you get back to that GPS, you get back in and you swim. I didn't want that kind of swim, but uh, we had no choice this time. And then by the time we were in the third day, um, uh, you know, the, the box jellyfish experts who had been writing into us from Miami said, get her out. If she's stung again that third night, she will not live because this animal you don't get immunized like some snakes. People who work with snakes, they make themselves get stung, you know, bitten over and over. Then they get they get immu Im immune to the uh, venom. Not the box jellyfish. You get sensitized. And I was told that if I had one more small sting that first night when I swam into the swarm, the tentacles were all around the neck, all around the bicep, all around the back. It was a massive sting. I swam into a swarm of them. But if I had just had one more tentacle sweep across my cheek, let's say, then I would have died. So um, we had to call that swim. Mother Nature on steroids again. Wow. Uh, another question is, this one's about the movie itself. What kind of, and this be for both of you, really, I think for, for, for both Bonnie and Diana, what kind of input did you have into the filming or into the movie story? You know, on, on one hand, they were all, starting with the writer, the producers, the directors, the stars, they were all very respectful of us and our story. They wanted to know everything. They read every book, uh, watched every TED Talk, watched the, the documentary that was already out called The Other Shore, which is on Netflix now, too, by the way. Um, so they, they, they had a lot of ammunition, but we were always apprised that... Hollywood, as much as they were going to be respectful of us, that they, it was their movie. They were going to make the story they wanted to make. And you know what? In the end, we could get into the weeds. Like, like if Bonnie and I were with you right now, we could talk for hours about, you know, what, what's real and what's Hollywood. But the truth is, they got the grit of the story. Yeah. They got the, the human spirit to not give up. In, in spades, and Aunt, Annette Benning played that, you know, with with a with a tour de force performance. Yeah, they great. got our friendship, and Jodie Foster was absolutely magnificent in her in her her friendship and her and her understanding of why her friend wanted to do this. Listen, they called the movie my name. <laughs> you you hardly ever get lucky like that. So yes, was it all exactly? Like, you know, I like to think I'm a little more likable than the, uh, <laughs> than the, than the, than the uh, but that's okay, because they decided um, they wanted her to be, I, I am in part that person, uh, you know, whom Annette played, and we're just so proud of the movie. So it's not, it's not a documentary, it's not meant to be, right. you know, every, every single moment, but but a lot of it, when you see that jellyfish scene in that movie, when you see that storm scene, when you see the training, when you see the, you know, we're going to come back, all of that's real and it's it's honoring. You know, we're, we're just so proud of the movie. Yeah, it was a, wonder, a wonderful movie. Uh, question, another new question uh, from Angie here in the audience. Uh, she says, I turned 60 in two days. Happy birthday, Angie. <laughs> Happy uh, birthday. How do, you, how, do you birthday take the, how do you take that first step mentally to follow your dreams? Kind of related to the quote from, from Goethe, I think, that you mentioned, maybe. Yeah, well, I guess I, I, it seems like your question is not relating to being 60. You know, uh, it's just you're saying, how do you take that first step? Yeah. Um, yeah, could be the way, easier. Andy, it must be nice to be so young. I, I, I really I can't remember. <laughs> I can't remember 60, honestly. I think it was a good time. I think it was a very good time. Um, but, you know, I guess what you say is, this is the way I put it. What is today? Uh, June 17th? Yeah. So none of us sitting in this room together today, none of us get to live June 17th, 2024 again. This is it. You know, whatever you've decided to do with this day, when you go to sleep tonight, that's it. Just chalk that. That's going to be a memory, you know, not a future. So I feel tremendous pressure to let any day go by. And like I said, going to the beach and looking at the at, out at the horizon 
and, and taking in Mother Earth. That's okay. That's an okay way in my, in my vocabulary. That's an okay way to spend the day. But I just don't want to waste any time. So I know what you're saying. How do you take that first step? But it's like I said before, take any step. You know, do do something that you don't, you're, you're just lost, you're, you're, nothing's exciting you, you know, take up pickleball, yeah. to, you know, just, just do anything to get out, be with people, try something new, see if you have some, some talent or desire, you know, within that field, and you'll get excited, or you'll take a turn in a different direction once you're out there, but just don't do nothing, that, 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 that'll never get you anywhere. Do you have any uh, question here, uh, this is actually the last question we had from the audience, uh, do you have any specific techniques or strategies that you use to achieve goals? Um, I guess I try to take an honest assessment, you know, to, 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 to see where I am. Um, like I said, I'm, you know, writing this children's book. I've never written a children's book before. It's for 8 to 11-year-olds. And um, I have to be an open book. I can't be, you know, in the, in the world of the swimming, I was much more, you know, don't tell me what to do. I know what to do, except for my, you know, my close relationship with my coach, Bonnie. But um, I'm not going to listen to other people's limitations of how old I am or what I should do. You know, it's my life. And uh, no one's going to tell me what what limitations there are on me. I'll decide. Um, but but like with this children's book, I'm I'm very careful to be respectful of people who work in that world. Children's books. I'm a respectful of kids. You know, I have a I have a nine year old kid uh, uh, who Leo who read the book for me last year, and um, he was so uh, insightful. And um, he said, you know, Diana, the, the mother dies in this book, and it's, it's part of the story. It's part of kids having to reckon with realities. And um, he said, you know, the mother, you don't even have her coughing. I mean, she's not sick. She doesn't go to the hospital and get tested, and then boom, she just dies. You know, you, you can't do that to us. <laughs> I'm a reader. Good <laughs> right? point, huh? He said, I'm invested. Yeah, he's good a, point. He's a nine-year-old, says, I'm invested. I care about your main character. I care about her mother. And you just you just killed her off, like in one page. <laughs> I guess my, my point is, whether it's that or other things I try, um, I, try to be, I try to be a bit respectful instead of, uh, unfortunately, like, I know everything. Because I, 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 I have that a bit, too. Do you Don't I, Bonnie? Yes, yes, you do. Thanks for asking. <laughs> is Bonnie involved? Hey, you want to see, see how Bonnie's doing on her puzzle? Look, well, yeah, we want to see. She's like a, look at that. She's like a genius. It, it, so this things. is an easy puzzle. Come on. No, but she starts off like me. This is what I do with every, okay. No wonder I don't I don't have much success at them. I don't know if you guys are jigsaws, but Bonnie doesn't even know what the picture looks like. She doesn't look at the box. Ooh. She just starts putting them all together. I look at this one piece and I look at the box and I say, let's see. It's got a little white line right in the middle of it. And then it takes me 45 minutes to place this. So but that's okay. That's the way I do it. It's okay. <laughs> is Bonnie involved in the in the children's book? Well, she's my first reader. She's a she's a big reader, and she was my first reader. And you know what I'm doing now? Because I know you got a lot of readers and writers in the room. Is that um, the advice I had from the publisher? And I'm not saying the uh, publisher is going to publish it, but we did send it. Um, my literary agent sent it Knopf because that's who published my my memoir. Find a way. <laughs> Find a way. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, she thought, she told me that she felt the story was compelling. The kid, her name is Darwin, she's a science prodigy, uh, that she's compelling. But she felt she wasn't feeling her feelings, that I was this omniscient narrator telling you how she felt. And she wants me to rewrite the whole thing from the first person point of view of Darwin herself. So that isn't easy. It's not, you just don't go through the book and replace you know, a pronoun with Darwin's side. I've got to rethink it and reorganize it. And I've been very busy. I've been lucky since the movie came out. I've been speaking all over the world. It's sort of a, what I do well in life is get up in front of people and orate. And um, I've been lucky. I've been getting, doing a lot of orating lately. But this summer, all that's slowing down a bit. So it's time for me to get back to Darwin. And what what is your writing process? What Do you have a set of time every day when you write or... Yeah. And, and where do you write? Yeah, I do. I, 
Yeah, I like to write in the morning. I, you know, when I'm when my energy is really big, I, I usually work out then. But if I'm going to be writing, I gotta I gotta make make that the priority. So I'm just beginning to get my notes organized. I'm going to start back into, I get up very early. You know, my, um, my father said something to me once, sleep is highly overrated. So now we're in this, uh, we're in this era, to my mind, it started with Ariana Huffington a few years ago. She had a big book about sleep. And right now sleep is a big deal. Everybody talks about sleep. And I'm not here to say, hey, we don't need sleep. We all need sleep. Our minds and our bodies need sleep. But I just doubt. I, I, I'm, I'm highly suspicious of the fact that all human beings need to sleep for eight straight hours a night. I don't believe it. I know I don't. Um, and, and a lot of people I know don't need to. And I don't think you need to sleep the same number of hours. You don't need to go to bed at the same time, wake up at the same time. Um, there's been proof now that we have no circadian rhythm that we're not really sleeping around the sun like we thought we were, the sun's, the sun's rays. So um, my point is that I get up very early every day and I also stay up late every night. Um, now I do fall asleep. Except if she's watching a movie or TV. It's so <laughs> annoying because she'll fall asleep and you know she'll wake up 20 minutes later. What happened? No, nope, gotta stay awake. Yeah, well, that's not as bad as my falling asleep in my car at red lights when I bump into the person in front of yeah. me. That, that's worse than falling asleep in movies. But um, anyway, uh, I get up early. If I'm writing or working out or whatnot, I like to get up before the sun. There's something about being up when it's still dark and now the, the dawn comes. I don't know. I find it, I find it inspiring and thrilling to be up before, before the dawn. Will you ladies entertain one more question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, di a different kind of question. What What were your thoughts about Cuba before you went, and then how did they change after you spent time there? Oh gosh. You know, I just had the um, the Cuban ambassador to the United States was just here at my house about a month ago. It couldn't be a more lovely woman. And now I'm going to be embarrassed because I I didn't have her name right in front of me. But uh, a modern a modern thinker. Um, but, you know, Cuba's tricky because I've made the mistake before. I've given interviews to the Miami Herald saying, but it was in the, in the beginning, wasn't a noble, wasn't it a noble idea that Che and Fidel Castro had was to take this vastly rich people who had either rich or poor, nothing in between, and turn them into a second class society where everybody had an education and everybody could get medicine and anybody could be what they wanted to be. No more vastly rich people, no more poor people. And he did that. He, he did that for several decades. And pe people did get an education. Most of the Cubans, I'm sure you, you know many there, right there um, in Winter Park near Orlando. But um, he, he did turn it into a second class country, but because of many other political issues when Russia went away and when Chavez died in Venezuela, now it's become a desperately poor country. But Bonnie and I try to stay out of the politics of it. We've been invited to go. They've seen the movie, The Cubans. They know it well. Um, and they would like us to come and do a special showing in the fall. And we go. And we don't make any political comments. We don't say, you know, when is the regime of Cuba going to change and help these people be able to make a living and, and use their great skills as lawyers and, you know, other, other professionals. We stay out of that because there is so much to each side. And the Miami Cubans, you know, are just revile against any sort of financial support, even us going to stay in a hotel for three nights is is wrong, you know, by them. And but the Cubans in Cuba want us to come, not to give money, but to inspire them. Uh, so we're looked at as as people who have lived an inspiring life, who have included their beautiful country in our story. You know, when I was a kid, standing on the beach in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, I asked my mom. We were the the revolution happened when I was nine years old. And uh, thousands of Cubans flooded into Miami, Fort Lauderdale, the Keys, yeah. you know, all of South Florida. And we, we became fascinated. We had, a, we had a mystique buzzing about that, that 
suddenly forbidden island. My parents had gone and danced salsa in the Hotel Nacional. All of us knew Cuba. We knew Havana very well when we were, when we were young. And now, in one night, in one 24-hour period, it became forbidden. That island, and it's been forbidden ever since. You know, we're talking about 70 years now. And I, 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 as a little swimmer, I was a little age group pool swimmer, I asked my mom on the beach one day, Mom, where is it? I know Cuba's right out there. Why can't I see it? And she said to me, it's right there. Havana is right across the horizon, right there. As a matter of fact, it's so close, you, you little champion swimmer, you, you could almost swim there. That's how close it is. Well, I'll tell you something. That's the day, age nine, that that phrase and that concept, swimming between Cuba and Florida, got embedded in my brain. It's, it, it, it never left me, that concept, and the love for the Cuban people I grew up with. That has never left me either, and I do wish them, um, I do wish them better. I'm, I'll just, I'll just leave it that simply. I wish them better. Has anybody, has anybody done the swim since you did, uh, without the Shark Tank? Oh, I'm never gonna do it. No. Yeah, Bonnie thinks nobody will ever do it. I don't know. It's not that they like, like, Michael Phelps could do it if he wanted, but it's. Nobody wants to swim 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 24 hours in training for this thing. Uh, it's not on their bucket list. <laughs> yeah, the training is big. Now the box jellyfish are there, so it's tough to prepare. Yeah, there's a lot of homework. Yeah, there's a lot going on down there. And I think that um, there we've, we've heard from a number of people, not so much in recent years, but, you know, the swim will be uh, 11 years ago this Labor Day. And in those first few years afterwards, we heard from people from Spain, from United States, different people who wanted us to be their trainers and get their whole expedition organized. And we would write them back to say, listen, um, we wish you luck. We honestly and wish you luck. We helped when we could. L listen, we, we, and Bonnie helped them, uh, you know, gave them our nutritional, you know, profile and all that stuff. If somebody does it, We'll be the first people on the beach to, oh, yeah. to be there and congratulate them yeah. when they come across. You know but there, there is something that's keeping out know, people. There's an incredible uh, woman today named Sarah Thomas. She lives in Denver. We just saw her in Denver two weeks ago. She has now swum across the English Channel and back four times consecutively. It took her 54 hours. Now, there aren't sharks and jellyfish, but it's cold. The waters are chilly. And um, I just bow down to Sarah Thomas. My swim would be too warm for her. You know, there are warm water and cold water swimmers, um, just like there are linemen in football, and then there are wide receivers. And they're all built very differently. They're specialists. So there are a couple of, starting with Sarah, um, extremely uh, brave and skilled and fit, good cold water swimmers, but Cuba would not be, they, you know, they would die to be in that warm water, just like I'd die if I were 54 hours in the English Channel. Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. Well, ladies, it's been wonderful having you here. Uh, you're, you're great guests, good storytellers, and... Uh, after you accomplish, uh, okay, one, one last thing. Tell us just a, briefly about the Everwalk. We, we want to hear a little, just a little briefly about the no. Everwalk. What, what is that and what, what's involved with that? You know, you know, what it is is that we got done with the Cuba swim, and here we were for years out out in the blue. We were We were traveling across the curvature of the earth, swimming island to island, and, you know, all day long around the island of St. Martin, and um, we just fell in love with planet Earth. Um, I'm just rereading uh, Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos right now. Uh, just, just I think that might be my favorite book I've ever read. I haven't read it for 30 years. But every sentence is something that I was taking in when I was out in that blue ocean. And Bonnie and I said, how can we lend this? How can we lend a sense of, of being out with purpose and traveling and appreciating you know, Earth and thinking of your own spirit and having a rhythm stroke by stroke that, that sort of gives you pleasure within your brain and starts you thinking about who you are, who you want to be, what you want to do. And we said, it's walking. You know, we can't. We, nothing else can bring that many people to the same sort of tenets 
that we felt when we were out there on the water. So we started Everwalk. Everwalk meaning everybody, every day, forever, for the rest of your life. And we have now led with several hundred people each time. Walks from uh, Boston up to Cape Elizabeth, Maine was one week. We went from Philadelphia to DC. We've done LA down to San Diego. Um, we haven't done a Florida walk, except we've done several walks in Key West, where we walk 10 miles every morning, and then we work for Habitat for Humanity all afternoon. Um, we've done walks in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the Hudson River Valley. We just a month ago were in the Blue Ridge Mountains in North Carolina. So we've, we've walked all over the place. And as I mentioned in the very beginning, we're starting, we started just this Saturday, a three month, but you can join month by month, you can join anytime, um, a virtual walk. You put in the miles or the steps you think you can average five days a week for the whole summer. You get a really cool t-shirt, that's the Everwalk Summer Challenge t-shirt, and then Bonnie and I are with you all summer. We write you and say, hey, Lynn, you know, I saw you, you exceeded by far you know, your goal, your goal uh, uh, challenge yesterday, what, what was going on? She'll write back and say, yeah, my sister was visiting and we decided to get on our backpacks and do a big 10 mile walk. So we, we, we just believe that walking is the answer to so many things. You walk and you find who's in your community. You discover your city. I was walking along a street close by me. I, I'd driven it hundreds and hundreds of times, all of a sudden I see this little beautiful pale blue, it was like robin's egg blue painted uh, lending library. It nestled in the tree and I go over and I look and I open the cool little, it was like somebody crafted it, I, a cool little glass door and I look in there and I see there's a book by Nietzsche and there's a book by uh, Lee Child, you know, and so if people in the neighborhood are putting and taking books and the woman from the home came out and I said, when did you put this up? She said, oh, about 40 years ago <laughs> when I grew up. <laughs> no, but when you're walking, you notice everyone. Uh, so we're we're into walking and we're uh, we're we're getting our ever walk sort of a fans to come out and walk virtually and walk real time with us everywhere. Thank you for that, and we really appreciate you being here. I, just, I, I know the audience really really enjoyed you. Good to meet you, Michael. Nice yeah, to meet nice, you, Michael. Nice, nice, nice to meet you. And 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 Bonnie, send us a picture when the when the uh, puzzle is done, so we can know what, it, yeah. so we can know what it is. We don't even know what you're working on, and you don't <laughs> either. It's a bunch of dogs, but the whole, they have the whole thing left. Show the top. Just, it's a silly picture. Uh, now okay. the only thing you have left is the light blue. So now I have to go just by shape. Gotcha. <laughs> We'll see you, ladies. Michael, you were just terrific. I really, yeah. I really yeah. appreciate you. And um, I wish I'd been there only, Bonnie and I, just so we, because uh, we're the friendly types. We'd like to mix in with all of you yeah, guys. Next, well, next time you, you come really through the me. area, we'll, we'll see if we can, we can do it again. Yeah. All right. We'd like it. Everybody says, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Right. Thank you very Bye. much. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Books and Beyond from the Winter Park Library. This podcast would not be possible without the generous help and support from the library staff, and especially from Jeremy Zorn. Jeremy's official title is Public Services Librarian, but he does many things here at the library, including producing this podcast. We can't do this without you, Jeremy. Our theme music is from the song Don't Go by Bovine Joe and the Buffalo Herd. That's Herd spelled H-E-A-R-D. We hope you'll let your friends and others know about this podcast and that you'll come by the library for one of our offerings, which you can find at winterparklibrary.org slash events. That's winterparklibrary.org slash events. If you have questions or suggestions for the podcast or just want to talk about books and beyond, please send an email to podcast at winterparklibrary.org. That's an email to podcast at winterparklibrary.org. Remember that the Winter Park Library promotes the free and open exchange of ideas and does not attempt to control or take responsibility for any opinions that may be expressed in this podcast. Opinions expressed in this podcast do not constitute or imply an endorsement or a reflection of the library's policies or beliefs. This is Michael Werner wishing you well until our next episode of Books and Beyond. <laughs>